Hello, it's Scott Manley here with part four of my history on communication satellites. And while we have been over in the United States for the first three episodes, it's time to go over and see what the Soviet Union was doing, which is important because, of course, Soviet Union pretty much invented the satellite and therefore you would think they would have a you know, some head start on getting communication satellites going. And while they followed up Sputnik with a bunch of other high profile firsts, they didn't really get going with the communication satellites until years after the US had started launching theirs. In fact, it wasn't until 1961 that the Soviet Union even had a, a communication satellite program in the form of Molnia. And, you know, it's actually somewhat understandable if you look at geography. While the Soviet Union is huge and it stretched across 11 time zones, it didn't have any oceans that were inconveniently in the way. So they could, in theory, have lines that run across the surface or microwave repeaters for uh, you know, signals. The Americas, of course, had the Atlantic on one side and the Pacific on the other, and they had a real need to talk across them. So the US was incentivized to develop communication satellite technology. So within the Soviet Union, um, there were many ministries that might have been interested, but uh, none of them really stepped up to the plate, so to speak. Uh, the Ministry of Communications, which effectively had a monopoly on such a stuff, uh, they weren't interested at all in working with the spaceflight people to build a satellite. Now, the military, they were good friends with the uh, satellite, the rocket builders, but they generally weren't interested either. Their communications people were focused on radio and you know, secure telegraph lines. But within the military, in the strategic rocket forces, there was a guy called uh, Nikolay Ivanovich Krylov, who was actually really interested in satellite communication. And he wanted some sort of way to command his missiles if perhaps communication lines had been cut on the surface. So uh, it was eventually agreed that a communication satellite program should be started up. And uh, they didn't have a huge amount of resources to work on this. They didn't have, for example, a launch vehicle that was well suited. While the Soviet Union had bigger and better rockets in many ways than the USA, uh, they didn't have a vehicle that could actually put a satellite into geostationary orbit. The communication satellite program would use a rocket called the 8K87, which was a version of the R7, which was supposed to launch uh, payloads towards the moon and to other planets. So it was a four-stage version of the R7. And the people that did the orbit calculations, they looked into launching a satellite and they realized that they would not be able to put a 100 kilogram payload into geostationary orbit. The US had put 40 kilogram payloads into geostationary orbit and that had been enough to broadcast uh, television signals to stations on the ground. However, they looked at other orbit opportunities and they came up with this idea of a highly inclined, highly elliptic orbit, which would uh, have a 12 hour period, would swing in very close to the Earth and go very far out and do it with an inclination so that it appeared over very high latitudes. This uh, was called, this would be christened the Molnia orbit after the Molnia program. And for this orbit, they could put a 1600 kilogram satellite into that orbit. That would be 40 times the mass of what the US did. So the trick with the Molnia orbit is that it relies on the fact that when the, space stuff, when the spacecraft are out at apogee, they're actually moving relatively slowly. So as the spacecraft is out at its apogee every 12 hours, it moves slowly relative to the surface so it can be tracked relatively easily. Uh, there's problems, however, with these orbits in that the Earth's shape, the oblateness, the fact that it has more mass around the outside will cause orbits to twist around. And I, I call this fat Earth theory. So if you have an orbit in 45 degree inclination, for example, it's the point where it crosses the equator gets pulled westwards by about four degrees every day. If you want it to keep up with the motion of the Earth around the Sun, you put it into a slightly retrograde orbit in 97 degrees, and that will cause its orbit to move around at about one degree to the east every day, nicely lining up with the motion of the Earth around the Sun. But there's a second way in which the oblateness of the Earth twists the orbit. It can make the position of the perigee and the apogee twist around in a circle over time. 
Uh, this is the precession of the argument of perigee. And it turns out that if you do the sort of series expansion on the orbital you know, solution, then there's a critical inclination at about 63.4 degrees where this is cancelled out by the shape. So if you put the orbit into this, uh, this inclination with the perigee up in the northern hemisphere, then it will remain up there. If you remember, the US launched Telstar and it was in an inclined orbit. It was eccentric, so it went out far and came in. Over time, that apogee would twist around into the southern hemisphere and they wouldn't really have any windows of communication while it was down there. And then it would twist around and come back up and then we'd regain that. The Soviet mathematicians were able to figure out a way to avoid this by choosing this very careful orbit. And it worked very well for the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union generally had a lot more land at higher latitudes. And by having your satellite situated at higher latitudes, it was easier, you could, you could point your satellite dishes upwards rather than having to find clear view to the south, which could be problematic. Um, also, you know, if you just look at the geometry, you can't find any place in geostationary orbit where you could put a satellite where it would be able to see every point of the Soviet Union. So they didn't need geostationary orbit right away. They found a better orbit and because it was easier to get to, they were able to put a larger satellite into it. And the Molnia satellite was a monster. It was hugely innovative. It was a multi-axis stabilized satellite. It had solar panels that would unfold. The spacecraft would hold orientation so that the panels pointed at the sun, it had a pair of parabolic antennas which would fold out and these would track the Earth, enabling a tight you know, control. Whereas, you know, things like Syncom, those were spinning, so they just had to have a pancake-shaped antenna pattern, meaning that they were spraying a lot of their radio energy into deep space. Um, the large satellite, uh, it was, as I said, it was stabilized. It was one of the first spacecraft. It may, I think it may be the first spacecraft to use control moment gyroscopes to adjust the attitude in addition to using uh, you know, thruster control. The uh, electronics on the Soviet spacecraft, because they're taking in a lot of power and they're operating a lot of electronics, they actually had to some, have some active thermal control on it. So they had radiators that would move heat from the electronics to radiate it out into space. Like the, the traveling wave tube, apparently when it was running, would cook the system if they didn't have the radiators running. And apparently they, they cooked at least one satellite on a test stand because they turned it on and they didn't have the cooling running at the same time. Um, so the spacecraft, it would operate its transponders at you know, one gigahertz and 800 megahertz, which was lower frequency than the US. And that did actually mean they had harder time fitting all the data into the same uh, bandwidth, but they were able to send you know, TV channels. They were able to send uh, about 30 telephone calls. Other interesting features of the Molnia satellite was that it had a propulsion on it and it was designed to adjust its orbit periodically so they could command it when it was coming down towards perigee to align with the Earth to figure out what way the, the prograde or retrograde vector was and um, then when it reached there it could fire its engine and either raise the orbit or lower the orbit to ensure the period of the orbit matched fine and it stayed over the Soviet Union. So yeah, this took several years to develop. They actually, you know, if you read uh, uh, Boris Chertok's book on the subject, uh, he talked about the importance of the testing, how they really stood up a bunch of testing hardware, which is still, was still used even in the 21st century. So yeah, first Molnia satellite to be launched was actually number two because it had made it through testing without uh, getting shipped back to the factory for fixes. It was launched in June of 1964, and unfortunately it failed. The rocket's third stage ran out of kerosene, and the turbo pumps oversped, and the rocket went out of control. Uh, so yeah, that was lost. A few months later, in August of 1964, satellite number one was finally back on the rocket, and it actually made it to orbit. And there was much rejoicing initially, the solar panels deployed, the spacecraft assumed its correct attitude. However, the antennas would not deploy. The booms that they were on would fail to extend. 
And this unfortunately meant they couldn't operate as a communication satellite. They could do some very limited tests of telemetry. They could send signals up and get them back, but they simply couldn't direct the antenna with enough power to be able to use it as a communication system. Over time, they figured out the problem was that the cables inside the boom, the insulation had getting worn down. And at one point when they were testing it at the launch site, an engineer had noticed this and wrapped them up with a PVC tape. And when, when they actually launched, that tape had got hard as it got cold. And it was stiff enough that it, was, it basically stopped the booms from deploying. They caught, didn't catch this during testing because they did the testing of the deployment when it was uh, before the tape had been added. So they were able to ultimately figure this out, and in April of 1965, they finally launched number three, and it did go into orbit successfully, and it did deploy the dishes and the solar panels, and then they went to turn it on. They sent the command and nothing happened. They sent the turn on command again, and again, nothing happened. And the engineers, they looked through the diagrams on the spacecraft to try and discern what could be wrong. And it was decided that it was most likely a relay that had been operated during testing a bit too much and was maybe a little oxidized. And if they just kept on trying to turn it on, then maybe that relay would close properly. It would knock the corrosion off and maybe they would get a complete circuit. So they started sending commands to turn it on repeatedly. And they got up to like the 15th, 16th, 17th, they don't remember, but then it came back and that was it. They finally had their communication satellite. They very quickly began testing. They sent uh, television signals to Vladivostok and Ussurisk. Uh, they sent, you know, set up telephone channels to demonstrate that that worked. They could carry about 30 channels in the bandwidth available. But the big problem that they found was the solar cells and the power system were degrading much faster than they expected. And based upon projections, they were going to run out of power in November. The reason for the power loss was that the spacecraft in its orbit would pass through the Van Allen belts four times per day. And I guess the Soviet semiconductors, the solar cells, were just not as uh, robust as the American versions. Now, the Soviet party really wanted to have a, a cool big event, I believe around November. <laughs> and so they very quickly rushed to get satellite number four ready to fly. And it did launch in October of 1965, keeping everything running. One of the other, well, it wasn't the big event that they were interested in. It was some sort of, you know, communist party thing. But uh, also in November of 1965, was the Soviet Union's first satellite transmissions to another country, to France. The Soviet Union was interested in adopting the SECOM TV standard, which France had developed. Uh, obviously, Britain had PAL and uh, so the USA had NTSC. So SECOM was what the Soviet Union was using. And so in November 27th, 1965, they were sending signals to France. And they were using the same station in France that they had used for uh, Telstar and Relay, so th this all of, of worked very well for them. So Satellite 4 survived, but it did degrade in power very quickly because they hadn't really had time to fix the solar cell issue before rushing it to flight. Uh, so the spacecraft was expected to fail in February and they very were very much running to get another satellite ready. One of the last things that Satellite number 4 would transmit would be the funeral of Sergei Korolev, the father, the head designer, the chief designer of the Soviet space program. He died in January of 1966 and had a full-on state funeral. Um, and so the spacecraft managed to transmit that and then fell silent about a month later, while satellite number five was still being tested for launch at the launch site. And this failure meant that there was no longer satellite TV being relayed to Vladivostok, and that caused a bit of a political issue. Suddenly the people there had got accustomed to getting their real-time updates from Moscow and the people with uh, power and clout were not too happy with this. So satellite number five did get set up for launch in March and unfortunately that launch did not succeed. Again, it went, it didn't <laughs> fail to reach orbit. 
Now, the other replacements were still in the factory. They were starting to get upgrades uh, to various things. So number six, for example, was getting uh, fixes to the power system with their new panel designs. Um, but it also was getting a special new feature, a camera. A camera which would be used to take photographs of the Earth from high up, high latitude, and to analyse cloud cover. And this, of course, is great if you're going to do weather analysis. No doubt the weather forecasters in the Soviet Union would be very interested in this, but it was the military that was even more interested. Because of the 12-hour period, it pops up over the Soviet Union, goes down, and when it comes up 12 hours later, it's sitting over the USA. And from there, they could see where all the clouds were over the USA. And they, while they weren't interested in forecasting weather for their American citizens, they were interested in cloud cover that might obscure targets for the Zenit spy satellite system that was being used. That's what that was primarily for. So satellite number six would launch in April. And it did restore the link to Vladivostok. There was much rejoicing, but it only lasted until September before, again, it fell silent. And the link was lost. Satellite number seven, it went up. And finally, all that hard work paid off. And it was able to operate for over a year into January of 1968. One of the other features that was added, as well as more robust shielding for the components and solar cells, was the they packed extra solar cells on board that would be folded up. And as they were getting towards the end of the life of the cells, they could open these ones up, exposing them to space and uh, getting a boost in their power until they too were rendered ops or rendered uh, ineffective due to the radiation. But satellite number seven being successful for a long period finally allowed the Soviets to get ahead of the curve and start replacing satellites or getting satellites launched before they actually started failing. Moreover, they started to be able to get enough into orbit that they could operate as a constellation providing 24-hour service. These were set up with 90 degree aparts on their orbit so that as one began to fall back down, another one would be rising to take its place and the antenna could always track them. And with this, they began to set up the Orbita TV station, the first world's first satellite TV network. They would build these uh, ground stations, which uh, were you know, fairly large, you know, 12 meter dish, and these would receive the satellite transmissions and then send them out to TV antennas that would cover a region. And they built about you know, 20 of these in 1967 onwards before they finally you know, started deploying it for real. Over time, they would build hundreds of these over the Soviet Union. And indeed, they actually built a few of these orbiter stations abroad. Uh, they had them at Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia, uh, in Cuba, and Prague, Czechoslovakia all had their own stations. There was also a ship-based system which would act as a, a ground station either to transmit or receive. This was on a ship called the Komarov, named after Vladimir Komarov, who of course died on Soyuz 1. So uh, this, the Molnia satellites would of course get some iteration over time. The Molnia 2 would add higher frequency ranges, enabling more bandwidth, and it began launching in 1971. Molnia 3, again, had improvements. It la began launching in 1974. And also in 1974, a proton rocket, a much more capable launch vehicle, would launch a Molnia satellite into geostationary orbit. It would be the only one of this constellation that was tested in geostationary orbit. The subsequent satellites in geostationary orbit were better configured. There was, I think, Raduga is like for rainbow and Horizont, uh, which is like um, Horizon. These would be the various satellites that they would use as uh, geostationary communication satellites. But the one that would stay alive longest would be Molnia 1, because while Molnia 2 and 3 would handle civilian communications, Molnia 1 kept uh, its military routes, let's say. Um, they would keep launching Molnia satellites right up into 2004. So that gave it like a 30-year lifespan, right? 40-year lifespan. Um, yet over time, because of the high replacement rate, they had to launch something like 164 Molnia satellites. And of course, the launch vehicle, which began with a, a name unrelated to the constellation, it ended up getting Molnia as its name. Now, after 2004, there was a more modern replacement still using this orbit. It's the, the Meridian, again, military constellation. 
And there are also many Molniya satellites still in orbit to this day. Once they go offline, they are dead. The, the orbit kind of gets shifted around because it's quite an eccentric orbit. And frequently the interactions of the Earth, Sun, Moon will drive the orbit down inside the atmosphere and it will burn up. But it can take decades for this to happen. So yeah, that was what the Soviets were up to. They eventually caught up and they did their own thing. They built some of the biggest communication satellites for a long time. And indeed, after the breakup of the Soviet Union, Russian launch capability was enough that they would actually launch a bunch of communication satellites for other countries. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.